Yokoya is a lonely loser who misses his mama's jugs who left to get some milk, but his life changes for the better when a plotful maid assassin asks him to employ her and be his master. It was a normal day for Yokoya, who's sleezing around, sleeping till noon, but suddenly, someone rang his doorbell, forcing him to get up. When he goes to the door on the camera, he sees a maid who looks like Emo Violet Evergarden, asking him to employ her as his maid. After Yokoya lets her in, he lets her sit on his couch, gives her a drink, and starts thinking to himself that she's here either to sell his kidneys or to sell him some happy white powder. He asks her about her previous experiences as a maid, but instead, she tells him that she worked as an assassin before who targeted people who rebelled against her master, the same master that sent her here. Yokoya thinks she's joking, but after realizing she's not, Yokoya gets nervous. He asks about her boss and his relation to his family, and she starts explaining how her boss once owned a goldfish who had a baby that turned into a dog who lived for Nemo, and that guy was the friend of Yokoya's mom. Yokoya slaps her hand out of frustration, but quickly realizes he screwed up, potentially pissing her off, so he changes the subject and asks her about her specialty method in assassinating people. Then, they go outside and she pulls out her knives, does a backflip, eats the knives accurately at the tree, and shows her specialty, which is knife throwing. She proudly smiles and explains that knife throwing is just one out of many of her abilities as an assassin. But despite having seen her amazing abilities, Yokoya tells her that he can't employ the female John Wick as his servant. While it does upset her, she understands his decision, apologizes for taking his valuable time and leaves. As she walks through the door, Yokoya falls to his knees in disbelief at what just happened. But when he looks down, he finds something. Meanwhile, the maid is walking by herself without a purpose thinking to herself what she needs to do next. She looks back, expecting Yokoya to chase her, but gets disappointed to see no one there. However, just as she's crossing the train track, Yokoya screams out for her, with the bell in his hand, stating that she left it behind. When the maid turns around, truck is about to send Yokoya to an isekai, but she goes flying raging and saves Yokoya from his death. Unlike before, the maid looks adorable with blushes on her cheeks and Yokoya thanks her for saving him. She apologizes for saving him, stating she never saved people before, and that her heart is beating fast. Yokoya hands her the bell, and she thanks him for giving it back before she leaves again. However, as she's walking away, Yokoya changes his mind and tells her that he needs her help with cleaning. Back home, Yokoya is in shock seeing all the knives she has as she's unpacking her stuff. While the maid is blabbing about how her knives could have stopped the rumbling, Yokoya stops her and tells her he needs her to clean his trash not cleaning the streets from the 304s with daddy issues. However, she only has cleaning corpses in her mind, and Dukoya tries his best to explain that it's a different kind of cleaning and that he needs a housekeeper. She asks him if he will really hire her as long as she does his chores, and he agrees. Later, Yokoya comes back to a mess with her wet, holding a broken mop and a bucket on her head. She starts apologizing profusely and suddenly slips from the wet floor but quickly maneuvers herself to land like Spider-Man while still having the bucket smack her head. After what he has seen, Yokoya asks her if she's actually clumsy, and she apologizes for her mistakes, while feeling ashamed of herself. Yokoya takes the bucket off her head, gives her a towel, and tells her that she can start learning from now on, with him helping alongside her. He asks her to continue, and she cutely nods. Hours later, the place is squeaky clean, and Yokoya praises her for her hard work, making her happy. Then, Yokoya sees the time, realizes it's time for dinner, and asks her if she can cook. She looks down like a poor dog, and Yokoya assures her that it's okay as he will be doing the cooking while she takes a bath. In the bathtub, the maid thinks about Yokoya while blushing, getting herself wet from the water inside out. Meanwhile, Yokoya is outside thinking out loud to himself, feeling anxious, and not knowing what to do when a plotful emo maid is taking a bath just meters away from him. He gets heated thinking about the maid coming out with only wearing towels, but she comes out in full uniform, disappointing Yokoya. Then, they start dinner, and while Yokoya warns her, the maid feels confident and starts chopping the cabbages like they're human bodies. Yokoya pulls out some ramen and fried pork, and it confuses her on what fried pork is. She explains that she might eaten them before, but she has never been much of a foodie to care much about what she eats. The maid states that eating is only to sustain life, and flavors are not important. But Yokoya assures her that one bite of the fried pork will make her cream and release happy noises like she's in food wars. Yokoya feels confident in these discounts fried pork and splits it into two portions for himself and the maid. But he realizes that he doesn't know her name, 
The maid tells Yokoya that she doesn't have a name and that her master usually gives her a name. At first, he wants to name her Big Steve 9000, but chooses to give her a name later after getting some inspiration. Then they start eating and after her first bite of the fried pork, she still thinks that she can't tell what Tasty is like, triggering her memory of a dark past. But this time, she feels warm inside and tells Yokoya that his meat tastes delicious. She tells Yokoya that both the food and him as a person feel warm to her. But he doesn't hear what she says and tells her that he has prepared a room for her to stay. Yokoya tells her that he prepared the room beautifully just for her. And after hearing this, she remembers an ever darker past of her bathing in blood. But unlike those times, she wants her new master to treat her with care. Yokoya notices her pork doesn't have sauce unlike his, so he hands the sauce to put on her pork, and after she takes a bite, she feels the umami in her mouth, making her squeal out happy noises to the almighty tonkatsu sauce. Later at night, Yokoya wakes up crying at night after he had a bad dream, but then his stomach starts growling. He walks down to eat something, but suddenly a voice comes out from his kitchen. He gets scared thinking that the maid is plotting something, and when he looks inside, he sees the maid snacking on the tonkatsu sauce. They both freeze awkwardly before she tries to apologize for being a new sauce addict, but Yokoya tells her it's okay and asks if she's also hungry. Then, Yokoya whacks out a saucy hot pot and they start eating, which she is really enjoying. The maid asks Yokoya if he is having nightmares, and after the answers, she reveals that she heard someone sleep talking in his room. She thinks that an assassin entered his room, so she enters with knives in her hands, but instead of an enemy, she sees Yokoya sleeping with tears in his eyes. Yokoya feels embarrassed, and she states that he was calling out for his mom in his sleep, which embarrasses him even more. She tries to cheer her up, stating that she also had a dream where the sauce talked to her, saying that she can lick the sauce all she wants as he will stuff her up. But before she starts licking, she wakes up from her sleep. However, she states that it's the first time she dreamt about something apart from assassination, and that it's the first time she wanted to continue a dream, unlike her other dreams. She feels upset that Yokoya has a nightmare on the same day, and that she can't comfort him. Yokoya confesses that he has this dream of her mom leaving him for a new daddy, and that he will start crying if he wakes up not lying on his mother's lap. After hearing this, the maid offers him her lap to lie on, and when Yokoya rejects her offer, she gets sad thinking that she can never comfort people, only murdering them. Suddenly, Yokoya lies down, breaking her darkness, and they both feel warm with each other. Yokoya looks at her face, realizes she's looking back at him, and he sleeps right on her warm and plumpy lap. In her mind, she wonders why her heart was beating so fast when she saved Yokoya, unlike the times when she sent people to their deaths. So she wants to understand why her body moved fast to save him. The next morning, she plays Fruit Ninja on the trash before putting them in the bag. And when Yokoya asks why she does that, she explains that it saves space which impresses Yokoya. Suddenly, they find a stranded dog in front of the house, and beside it is a letter from a broke dunny who left the dog at Yokoya's house, thinking that he's a wealthy man who will gladly take care of it. Despite his objection, Yokoya wants to take it in, not wanting it to die out of abandonment, but unlike her master, the maid has a different way of thinking. She states that the little dog has its own animal instincts, and saving it out of sympathy would make the dog less capable in its abilities to survive hardships. Turning the dog into a little she asks Yokoya if he's ready to take that responsibility, and he simply doesn't care about all that cheese, stating that just like him saving the dog, she didn't save him from his death out of sympathy, and that when one's life is in danger, a person's body would move on their own, wanting to save them. It touches the maid's feelings hearing what Yokoya said, and he tells her that just like the dog, he knows what it feels like to be abandoned. Then he takes the dog inside and quickly gets attached to it. But unlike him, the maid keeps her distance from the dog like it's a plague. Yokoya tries offering the maid to touch the little bugger, but she slides away from it. And after seeing her reaction, Yokoya realizes that she is scared of dogs. She starts figuring out of shame which Yokoya thinks looks cute, but she informs him that she would forcefully touch it if her master orders her to, which Yokoya tells her he won't. He asks her why she's scared and the maid explains that during one of her assassin trainings, she was left in a mountain filled with fierce wild dogs from Berserk. Yokoya understands her trauma and deems it a shame that she can't help take care of the dog. But after hearing her master call it a shame, the maid feels disappointed in herself. With full chest and jugs, the maid asks to hold the dog, but in her first attempt, she holds the puppy like holding an active nuke, causing her to shiver her milkers. After Yokoya asks which part of the dog scares her, she points out the claw, the teeth, and the devilish eyes. 
but Nikoya says that unlike her, he sees it like it's a mochi which to her is an alien concept. Suddenly, the dog gobbles on her finger, causing her to start tweaking, almost yeeting the little b turning it into a hot dog. After calming down, the dog nibbles on Yokoya. And seeing this phenomenon, Yokoya checks its teeth and realizes that it's teething, so they take it to the animal hospital. While Yokoya takes the pup for a checkup, the maid goes shopping for some dog supplies, impressing Yokoya and the dog with how caring she can be. They take the dog on a walk, and after everything she went through, the maid tells Yokoya that she has never met a stud as gentle as him. She tells him that unlike him, her previous masters were cold and only cared about her finishing the job, not tolerating any failures, unlike Yokoya who treats her gently, despite her plenty of failures. She asks him to let her stay in this world of his, a world different from hers where everything is cold and survival is the name of the game through assassinating people and finishing a job. The maid wants to be like the dog who meets him in a world of warmth and eventually becomes someone that Yokoya wishes for. After everything she says, Yokoya tells her that what she wants is to stop being an assassin and start becoming a normal girl, something that she never thought about before. To send people to their deaths was the only thing that she knew in her entire life, but now, with her new master, she feels hopeful that she can learn more about him and this wonderful new world. Yokoya confesses that while at first he was scared of her, but now he sees her as nothing but a good kid. Hearing herself getting called a good kid reminds the maid of her past, and because of this, she asks him to help her become a normal girl. Despite Nikoya not knowing much about tampons and pads, he tells her that she should start learning to feel normal when she makes mistakes, and not be pressured too much by it. The next morning, the dog wakes up to the sound of her learning how to cut cabbage, and she wants to learn how to make okonomiyaki so she can pair it with some sauce that she loves. Suddenly, the dog instant transmissions to her leg, causing her to freak out, not believing that a normal dog can sneak up behind her and assassin. The dog's stomach growls, and realizing that it's hungry, she feeds it dog food. While the dog is busy going to town on the food, she tries to touch it, only to stop when Yokoya appears. He starts caressing the little fluff, and after touching its fat belly, Yokoya decides to name the dog Mochi. Yokoya praises the maid for feeding the dog and cutting the cabbage, giving her a twirl before praising her work, which rizzes the maid. On his leg, Mochi starts humping and asks to play, but Yokoya can't play as he needs to prepare dinner. However, the maid tells him that she will take care of it, stating that she wants to be a normal girl who can believe in what he said when Yokoya says that the dog is a bundle of fun. Yokoya uses his daddy Riz and tells her he believes in her too, folding her ten folds and firing up her passion. With full trust in her master, the maid starts touching the dog, and with each caress, she starts getting closer to it, giving it the almighty belly rubs and touching its paw. Now she understands that, just like Yokoya who's scared of her at first, she grows to trust the little doggy, just like how Yokoya grows to trust her. At dinner, she starts creaming after eating the saucy okonomiyaki, and when Yokoya offers her a second portion, she tries denying it while her body language shows that she's excited for his saucy and creamy dish. Yokoya assures her that if she has a request, she should just ask him for it, and seeing this opportunity, she asks him to give her a name. Yokoya starts thinking and asks her about her birth date and while she doesn't know the exact date, she knows it was during the winter. Yokoya has an idea and names her Yuki, taken from the snow. It reminds her of her old boss, who calls her cold-blooded. But unlike him, Yokoya likes the snow because it looks beautiful, reminding Yuki of her past when she made a snowman. Yokoya yaps some riskful theory that snow is also warm when it covers a field, protecting the seeds from the cold and for them to eventually bloom into beautiful flowers with the help of the snow's protection. After hearing his yapping and seeing Yokoya's clapped face, it makes Yuki wonder why everything on her life becomes more warm and beautiful when she's alongside him. She realizes that as long as she stays in his world, she will one day understand what it's like to be normal. With her reason in full effect, Yuki thanks Yokoya for naming her, and she starts glitching out smiling, and it makes Yokoya happy to see her smile normally. Days later, while Yuki is playing with Mochi, Yokoya appears and asks her for a favor. She asks what it is, and he reveals that he wants to get his ear pierced, and he wants Yuki, who already has her pierced, to help him pluck a hole in his ears. She accepts his request, but after she puts the blade near his ear, she pulls back and starts tweaking, terrified to plush a hole in her own master. Suddenly the bell rings and when Yuki opens the door, she finds a girl looking for her brother who is confused at the sight of Yuki and Yuki realizes that this is Yokoya's little sister, Riko. After she gets inside, Riko can't believe that her wimpy loser of a dumb brother 
manages to get his hands on a plotful maid like Yuki and asks him why he never told her about this in their regular family meetups. He tries explaining that their mother would probably freak out, and their dad has given him the okay in hiring a maid, despite not knowing how plotful she is, but Rico still doesn't take his excuse for lying to her. Yuki asks them why they live separately, but instead of answering, Rico starts creaming, which confuses Yuki on why this girl is so freaky. Rico tells Yuki that she's so beautiful, and Dakoya explains that Rico loves beautiful people while hating ugly dudes like your viewers, hence why he doesn't want to tell her about this. Rico starts pouting while abusing her brother, but after calming down, she finds out that Yuki was named by her master Yokoya, which confuses Rico. Just then, Yuki starts yapping about how she was once a nameless assassin before Yokoya gave her a name, and this causes Rico to malfunction. However, she quickly changes her opinion into thinking it's awesome and asks her to sign her notebook, which Yuki gladly signs, but after Yuki finishes signing her signature, it looks like deranged worms. Yuki defends herself, saying that she can speak 12 languages as she traveled a lot as an assassin, but she has never studied calligraphy, and Riko has an idea. She wants Yuki to be her summer research project, and while Yokoya objects, Riko rizzes Yuki, saying that she is the one she needs. She asks Yuki to show her assassin's side, and despite her brother's reasoning, she assures him that she will reverse the story and make a maid who looks like an assassin instead. Then, they go to the backyard, put an apple on top of Riko's head, and Yuki yeets a blade perfectly at the apple, almost giving Yokoya a stroke. Riko asks Yuki how many knives she has and where she puts them, and Yuki answers she has five. However, as she's about to show the knife under her plumps, Yokoya stops her, enraging us viewers who want to see the heavenly snoo snoo. Later, while Riko is asking Yuki more of her nonsensical questions, her stomach growls, signaling that she needs food, but she asks Yuki if she has a special dish, and Yuki says that she does. So she starts chopping up some cabbages, impressing Riko with her skills, and just serves them on a plate with nothing else, which Riko praises by saying that Popey would love it. However, they go to a whack Donald's for a bite, and there, they see a poster for a fireworks festival. Yokoya tells Yuki that the festival sells saucy senbai, and she starts creaming and drooling at what he says, so they decide to go to the festival. After they arrive, Riko pulls Yuki to a shooting game booth, and while Riko is trash at it, Yuki pulls up the gun like she owns the place, but also misses, and she confesses that she's too do at shooting. At the goldfish catching game, Yuki uses Sharingan and catches a lot of fish, and when Riko asks for her secret, Yuki patiently teaches her how to do it, and the clerk praises her for being a good sister. Then, they buy the sauce sent by which Yuki is excited about, and after she takes a bite, she almost sends a flood down her plot from how delicious it is. She starts eating it quickly, and seeing how much she enjoys it. The clerk gives her more for free, causing her to malfunction. Riko goes to buy some drinks, and when Yokoya wants to stop her, Riko assures her brother that she will be fine. While they wait for Riko to come back, Yokoya asks Yuki about her previous festival experiences, and she tells him that instead of having fun, she once had to do a mission at a festival where she stabbed a man in the back with a knife while they both watched the firework. Yokoya is in shock, and before he says anything, the fireworks start, and Yuki is in awe of the fireworks and its beauty. Riko comes back with drinks, saying that summer festivals are the best, and with a smile on her face, Yuki agrees. Yokoya folds seeing her and accidentally busts his drinks, then on their way home, Riko scolds Yuki for eating too much sauce, warning her that she might become the next Nick of Kato Avocado. Suddenly, someone screams that there's a robbery, and from behind, motorbike Kun almost eats Riko from life, but Yuki manages to save her in time. However, Riko starts tweaking after Yuki saved her like a princess, but Yokoya is not happy to see that their sauce is now spilled, stating that the robber should meet Ace in Hell immediately. Yuki takes her master's word literally and goes full Anbu to chase down the motorbike. Being excited, Riko wants to follow her so she can see the robber's brain getting yeeted from his head. They follow Yuki, who's running on rooftops like Spider-Man, slowly leaving them behind, but Riko finds a shortcut, and they take it. After finding the robber, Yuki majestically throws her nods at him, hitting his tires, but as she approaches the robber with malicious intent, Yokoya screams out for her to stop. However, Yuki just flicks his helmet as punishment and says that she's hungry again, and Okoya gladly says they should buy more sauce senbai. As they leave, they leave the robber traumatized and he now wants to go to jail at his own will. 
After they buy the food, they go home and Riko is excited to show her class her summer project, which puzzles Yuki about what school is. Riko starts telling her how amazing schools are, stating it is a great place, which you viewers know is a scam, but she gets a sudden text from her mother who has cooked beef stew for her. Riko rushes to go home, but despite her rashness, Yuki sees it as something normal, and after what Riko tells her, she tells Yokoya that she wants to go to school. The next morning, Yokoya goes to school, wondering if Yuki will be okay in her new school. His friends pop up telling him about a rumor of a thick plotful made in town, causing him to burst out his milk. Yokoya tries playing dumb, saying he doesn't know what he's talking about, but suddenly, the teacher introduces a new student, and in comes Yuki in all her glory as the new student, causing Yokoya to short circuit. She introduces herself as Yuki, Yokoya's cousin, but when she sits down in front of him, she calls him master, which shocks everyone. After school, Riko pops up, asking him how school is, and while stone-faced, Yokoya realizes that she's behind this, prompting her to celebrate her operation's success. On her way home, Riko glazes Yuki, saying that before Yuki joined school, she had been able to learn everything that needed to be learned about school in three days. Yokoya then asks how is Yuki suddenly his cousin that convenient is in his class in the same school, but they choose to hide this from him. They answer that Yuki has a connection from her assassin job that registered her here in the same class as him, and Riko suggested that she should be his cousin, so it would be easier to explain their interactions in the future. However, it was Riko's idea that they keep it a secret so she could see Yokoya's reaction afterward. Yokoya smacks her head, but after seeing this, Yuki gets distressed, asking if she's at fault. Yokoya changes his tone and tells Yuki that he doesn't mind in hopes that they can both enjoy their school life. The next day, students rush out of class wanting to eat some katsuda bread, and it interests Yuki. Yokoya asks her what she wants for lunch, and she answers katsuda bread. He explains that katsuda bread is more rare than the one piece, and she needs to be quick during lunch hour to get them. He draws her a picture, showing that their classroom is the farthest from the cafeteria. And while Yokoya feels pessimistic, Yuki feels fired up and tells him that if Escobar can get the bread, then she can get it too. With full conviction, she jumps out of the window and goes to the roof, and despite Yokoya's attempt to stop her, she runs on the railing like a ninja. Here, Yokoya realizes that he can't stop after seeing her eyes resembling a girl looking at food, deeming that when sauces are involved, not even Aizen or Thanos can stop Yuki. Yokoya looks down and sees the sweaty Katsuda bread-obsessed dudes running to the cafeteria, and he fears that Yuki will drop down in front of them, exposing her secret. But just as Yuki is about to jump down, she turns and swings straight to drop in front of the cafeteria, and there, she buys one bread and one sandwich. However, she informs Yokoya that the store only allows her to buy one due to the limited amount being sold. He pulls out another sandwich and tells her that he can just eat this. Yuki feels conflicted and tells Yokoya he should have the katsuda bread, but he assures her that she should have it, saying that she earned it. After the first bite, Yuki starts squealing out of happiness, but despite her joy, she splits the sandwich and feeds him, sharing her joy. That night, Riko announces that she's staying the night, and while Yokoya doesn't like the idea, Riko calls him out for the privilege of being able to live with Yuki and clap her every night. She adds that she always wanted a sister that she could talk about boys with so much. She even imagined him as her clapped looking sister. Now, Riko has a great idea if Yokoya marries Yuki, her dream will come true, especially since Riko thinks that Yuki likes him. However, Yukoya tells her that Yuki doesn't feel romance, and that days ago when she made him gam on bread, she didn't show any reaction. Though Riko is still convinced, she does think that while their mother would agree, their father would not. Yuki shows up, asking who's getting married, surprising them both with her presence. Riko tells the truth and asks her if she likes Yokoya, and she tells them that she admires him, which causes Yokoya to malfunction. Later they hang out, and Riko asks her if she wears makeup stating that her natural face would put the Kardashians to shame. Yuki tells her she doesn't, and while Riko tells her that her face is the dream of many girls, Yuki says that her appearance has never given her any benefits in her old work. Riko thinks that, unlike Yuki, she doesn't have a pretty face, but Yuki rises her by saying that she likes how Riko looks, and Riko feels happy as no one ever told her this besides her parents. She asks if she can be as pretty as her, and Yuki tells her that ever since she started eating tonkatsu sauce, her skin has been clearer by the day, so offers Riko some of her tonkatsu glazed melon, which confuses Riko at first, but she ends up liking. 
Seeing this interaction, Yokoya thinks to himself that they're like sister, and he credits Riko for Yuki being able to adapt to normal life quickly. After seeing his thinking face, Riko calls Yokoya out, saying that he was imagining marrying Yuki so he can see this interaction every day. And while Yokoya tries to deny it, Riko asks him if he would be happy to marry someone as cute and playful as Yuki, to which Yokoya agrees, making Riko happy. While in the bushes, a cat is lurking. The next day in class, while the teacher is teaching them about how SpongeBob is a better show than Attack on Titan, he notices Yokoya sleeping and eats a chalk at him. But Yuki cuts the chalk without anyone seeing and causes Yokoya to go blind, which is not what Yuki wanted to happen. Then, Yokoya goes to the infirmary, and there he meets a plotful health teacher straight from high school DXD, Nina who is replacing the old health teacher. After he complains about his eyes, she tells him to sit on the bed, but Yokoya feels a weird aura from her. Nita starts interrogating him about Yuki, and when he tells her that Yuki is his cousin, Nita starts laughing, stating that he looks clapped compared to Yuki. While checking his eyes, she compliments his handsome face, and after she sees that he's healthy, she suddenly locks the door. Nita turns into the doctor every man wants, pushes him down, and crawls on him, teasing him to progress the plot, but before she gobbles his glizzy, Yuki barges in and stares Nita down. Yokoya crawls to Yuki in fear of the snoo snoo. But Nita says that it was a joke as Yokoya looks like a cute hamster when he sees her plots. Despite Nita's attempts to lure Yokoya back in, Yuki pulls him back and orders him to never approach Nita again. Suddenly, Yokoya remembers what Riko said and thinks that Yuki actually likes him and is jealous. Nita has enough and sends him away saying that the injury is not severe, and Yuki slowly backs Yokoya out of the room. As she pulls Yokoya away, Yuki apologizes for her actions, and says that she needs to tell him something, which makes Yokoya's heart beat faster. However, Yuki informs him that Nita is also an assassin, which shocks him. Meanwhile, the cat comes to Nita, and from the cat, Nita receives pictures of Yokoya's home, which Nita plans to destroy. Nito has a dream for her to one day live out her life on the beach with different sweaty dudes to clap, but before she gets to have that dream, she needs to assassinate both Yukoya and Yuki. Meanwhile, Ikuya struggles to sleep as Yuki refuses to leave his side out of fear that Nita, who they still don't know anything about, might jump in and assassinate Yukoya and his precious pickle. Yukoya tells her that he can't sleep like this, so, Yuki suggests an idea and lays next to him telling him that her thighs can help him sleep by squeezing him dry, which is what every man dreams of. Yakoya tells Yuki that he is worried about her, and while she gets shy after hearing that, she tells him that she can defend herself easily in her sleep using a pencil like John Wick. Yuki has a theory that Nita is someone who holds a grudge from her past, but she assures Yakoya while giving him the almighty hand-holding that she will protect him, the person who shows her what warmth feels like. Yokoya feels hot after all the hand-holding they did and wants to open the window, but Yuki stops him and opens it herself, saying that he could have gotten 360 no scope through the window if he's not careful. Suddenly, she smells some delicious katsuta sauce and realizes it's a trap, but before she gets to do anything, Nita is already inside, taking Yokoya hostage. Nita then calls Yuki by her real name, Shue, the white wolf of the dragon's nine offsprings and expresses her disappointment in Yuki for being easily tricked. Yuki pulls out her knife, but Nita threatens her that if she tries something dumb, Nita will play ping-pong with Yukoya's eyeball. Suddenly, Yuki starts yapping in Mandarin and threatens Nita by saying that she will feed her and her whole family to the dogs if she touches Yukoya, and this causes Nita to feel fear. She tells Yuki that she will wait for her at school for their duel to the death while Yukoya will be taken hostage. After they leave, Yuki remembers what her old master told her that all she is is the female John Wick without a happy ending, and Yuki pulls out her knife, determined to accept who she is, and saves Yukoya. Yuki plans to save Yukoya at all costs and leave the country afterward, continuing her life as an assassin if it means that Yukoya is safe. However, her heart tells her otherwise, as what she really wants is to continue the warm life Yukoya has been providing for her. Meanwhile, at school, Nita ties up Yokoya like he's in Fifty Shades of Grey, but after seeing his calm reaction, she asks Yokoya if he's not scared and hates Yuki for dragging him into her mess. Yokoya confesses that while he is scared, he also believes in Yuki who promised that she will protect him. Yokoya asks Nita about Shue, the person she has been talking about, and it surprises Nidhi that he doesn't know anything about Yuki despite having lived with her. 
Neda informs him that Shue is a monster who is considered to be special in her field, and coming from the dragon's nine offspring, dubbed as the White Wolf, she is Ye from spy family on steroids. Nitto adds that the Dragon's Nine Offspring is a group of elite assassins who have been involved throughout history, from JFK to Franz Ferdinand. Still, if Nitta can clap Shue's life, it will also skyrocket her reputation, which is what she's aiming for. Yakoya doesn't believe what Nitta is saying, stating that the Yuki that he knows is a precious girl with big jugs who often gets lost in the sauce and squeals whenever she's happy. Nitta reveals that she also can't believe what the almighty Shue has become under Yakoya's supervision, stating that when they talked about marriage, it pisses off Nitta so much that she wanted to yeet a nuke to their house. However, Nitta also thinks that Yakoya is not normal for being extremely calm in this situation, stating that there is something special about him that he's able to melt Yuki's dark and cold heart. Nitta believes that the more someone wants to protect, the weaker they become, so with Yakoya involved, she believes that she can finally send Yuki to meet Ace in Hell. Then, Yuki shows up, looking for smoke, and when Nitta shoots at her, she chops the bullets like they're nothing. However, Nitta has prepared a landmine under Yuki and shoots it to blow it up, believing that she has won. Just then, Yuki pops up in front of her, almost taking Nitta's head off, but Nitta manages to avoid it. After seeing Yakoya, Yuki calms him down and promises that she will save him. This annoys Nitta as she realizes that Yuki is not taking her seriously, and starts yapping about Yuki's past and how if exposed, it will force Yuki to move out from Yukoya's peaceful home. Yuki tells this Walmart Catwoman wannabe to shut her dirty mouth as all Yuki is worried about is that Yukoya has school tomorrow, and he needs to sleep before the morning. Nitta gets pissed and asks Yuki if she can't talk about anything else aside from Yukoya. And to put insult to injury, Yuki starts talking about Riko, Machi, and her favorite sauces. Nitta has enough and reveals her secret weapons, which all of them aim at Yukoya, threatening him that if he struggles, the guns will shoot his limbs off and make him nothing but a torso. Having enough, Yuki rushes at Nitta, which scares her at first, but then, she activates her guns to shoot Yakoya. However, using the force, Yuki throws his knife to the sky, pulls out her smaller blades, and eats them at Yakoya to block the bullets. As Yuki gets closer, Nitta tries to use her other plans, but Yuki's knife stabs her phone and destroys her plans. As Yuki approaches, Nitta starts remembering who Shue really is, and when Yuki tells her to give up, she points a gun at Yukoya, only for Yuki to stop her and kick her down. Nita starts yapping, telling Yuki that she will always be Shue, the great assassin who claps people's lives and cuts their limbs, and tells Yuki that it's impossible for assassins like them to live a normal life as other assassins will come for her. Yuki agrees with her statement, saying that her old self has nothing else in her life but assassinating people, but she tells Nitty that she won't take anyone's life anymore nor let other people die because of her. Yuki believes that for her future, she will fight for what she believes in to gain the normal life she always wanted. Nitta can't believe what she's hearing, seeing the great white wolf Shue letting her prey go, and prefers to save Yakoya instead. Nitta realizes that Yuki is not a perfect assassin, but simply a girl who is willing to do anything for what she truly cares about. Nitto smiles and starts laughing, knowing that she never had a chance against Yuki in the first place. On their way home, Yuki apologizes to Yukoya for getting him involved, and tells him that she's willing to disappear just for his sake if he wants. Instead of answering, Yukoya takes her hand, and using his riz, he asks her to teach him self-defense techniques so he can help her, which makes Yuki happily blush to know that he still wants her to be with him. Comment, two thick plotful assassins, and one lucky guy, if you want a part 5. And if you like anime recaps like this, then watch this video right here.